Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Dan Baer, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy Research here, and delighted to have you all here for what promises to be a wonderful program this afternoon in partnership with ECFR, um, with whom we share values, interests, and, in and increasingly geography, because ECF ECFR is also in our building now. Um, I'm really excited to hear from uh, Yvonne and Mark about their new report, and from Sophia, uh, who is my wonderful colleague here in the Europe program, and from my cousin Sylvie, because as I told you the last time I saw you, I am descended from the Kaufmans of Strasbourg. Um, um, one of the things about today's program as we think about the world in which we're in is that uh, as clear as the strategic stakes of the war in Ukraine remain, and last week Jake Sullivan said there is no plan B, um, the strategic stakes are clear, but increasingly we're living through a time of ambiguity about what's going on on the ground and what the outcomes will be. And um, the ambiguity and heartbreak, I think, are challenging to us morally and also challenging strategically because there's nobody who loves ambiguity more than Vladimir Putin, and he is increasingly using that against uh, Ukraine and the West. And one of the ways that we see that manifest is in the increasing divergence between politics, both in Europe and the United States, and what we know to be good policy. And that part of the conversation today, I think, will be uh, an important contribution to trying to get back to a convergence of politics and policy in the months to come, which is essential for Ukraine's success and survival. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeremy. Hi, I'm Jeremy Shapiro. I'm the head of the new ECFR Washington office, which is coincidentally located in this building. Um, we're very excited to be working with Carnegie and very excited to be opening up a Washington office. And this event, which is our inaugural event, is a, the, an example of the kind of thing that we want to do with Carnegie and with uh, all of our research programs that come to town. We have a lot of research on the transatlantic relationship on Europe, and we want to bring it to Washington. We want to sh we want to show you how Europeans think about these issues, which is distinct, although not opposed to how Americans think about it. Uh, and we want to share the experiences and the research that we're doing, and the the research that uh, Mark and Ivan will present and that Sophie will comment on is a good example of the kind of uh, public opinion polling that we're trying to do to get at this question, which I think is so essential these days, and it was what Dan alluded to, is you know, what, what, does our, what do our publics really think about some of these foreign policy issues that have traditionally been so much a province of the, of the, the foreign policy establishment in both the US and Europe? And I think we all have the sense that this is becoming a more populist age, that we have to pay attention more to those things. We have to understand what people want, even if we are not slaves to the, to the public passions. And so that's part of what we're trying to do here. And we, I think, are very lucky to have Sylvie Kaufman, who is, the, uh, who is currently an editor at Le Monde, but has long been uh, at that newspaper, and in fact, editor-in-chief for a long time. Uh, and a really astute observer of both uh, European and American foreign policy, but also about the political and public interactions with that to lead the panel. So I'll have her uh, come up and uh, with the panel, and, and she can introduce them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for being here and welcome to this uh, ECFR inaugural event. It's great to have a little bit more presence of uh, Europe in Washington, D.C. Um, in such an audience, I will, I will spare you the old joke about Henry Kissinger's uh, uh, phone number, but if you want to talk about Europe, if you want to talk to Europe, if you want to know more about Europe, please call the ECFR of new office in Washington here, and you can also call Jeremy Shapiro, who will be 
happy to share his phone number with all of you. Um, <laughs> so um, it's on, also uh, cheaper because American to American. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on on June uh, six to nine, uh, four hundred million citizens of the European Union uh, will be called upon to vote uh, in twenty seven member states to uh, elect. Uh, the European Parliament, it's going to be a very important election because of the context in which it's happening um, with such issues as uh, the war in Ukraine, migration, uh, the rise of the far right, uh, the fragmentation of the political landscape in many uh, European countries, uh, climate change, of course. I mean, all these issues are... Um, so important, and this uh, election will um, have major consequences on the future of uh, for the future of Europe. The feeling may not be shared so widely here. You'll correct me if I'm if I'm wrong later. Um, but uh, for many citizens of um, of in Europe, particularly those who live closer to the eastern border, um, this is an election in a time of war. Um, and then, of course. There is the other election, uh, the one we don't get to vote in, but which will also affect us in a major way. And this, uh, uh, this is the election that we'll be uh, watching very intensely on November 5, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So this will all come into our discussion this afternoon. Um, but what we are, starting, uh, are, are going to start with, that is to focus on the very uh, important and, and very useful and fascinating work that uh, Mark uh, has been um, directing uh, on this uh, state of the public opinion in, in, in Europe. Uh, so we're going to do this with Mark Leonard, uh, who is founder, co-founder, I should say, and director of uh, the European Council of Communication. <coughs> He's also the author of uh, The Age of Unpeace, and he presents the weekly podcast uh, of ECFR, World in 30 Minutes, which I highly recommend <laughs> to follow. It's very lively and it's very good. Uh, we also discussed this with Ivan Krastev. Ivan is a founding member, um, co-founding member of ECFR. He's the chairman of uh, the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia and a fellow at the Institute for Human uh, Sciences in Vienna. He's written many excellent books, uh, including the important After Europe. Um, and we are very pleased to have Sofia Besch uh, joining us. And Sofia, uh, of course, is a fellow of the Europe program at uh, Carnegie here. So thank you very much, Sofia, for joining us. So the way we're going to proceed is uh, Mark will uh, um, um, present this, uh, the main conclusions of this research that he's been um, directing, and then Ivan will give us his take, because he's been taking part also in this research. Then, Sofia, you will react and criticize and whatever, discuss or contest, whatever you want to, to say, and then we'll engage in a discussion, including with you, and I'll open the floor to, to questions, and then we can, I think, continue the discussion in a more informal way in a short reception afterwards, right? So, Mark, why don't you start? Thank you very much, um, CV. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here um, at Carnegie. We're thrilled to be um, uh, sharing uh, some space with you here and um, very, very grateful for the warm welcome that you've given us, Dan, um, and colleagues from, from Carnegie. Um, and as Jeremy said, our, our goal really is to try and not just help share some of the work the ECFR's network of national offices and researchers are doing um, about the world and the European perspectives on the world, but also for us to try and understand a bit more how the US is changing and the changing nature of American foreign policy, which is so critical for Europeans. And that's one of the things that we're also going to be looking at in this uh, data, which I'm going to present. Um, the, I'm just going to show you five slides which capture some of the most interesting findings that we had. And, and it's a report which Ivan and I co-wrote together, but Ivan will go into more depth about what the slides actually mean. But I'll just talk you through some of the, 
the sort of headline findings. And the background to this, the reason we called it war in elections, is because um, wars are sometimes fought and lost on the, the battlefield, but um, often they end at the ballot box as well. And certainly the case that the Vladimir Putin is hoping to win this war in the ballot box, something which has uh, eluded him on the, on the battlefield so far. And I think there is a, a, a kind of strong hope in, in Moscow that war fatigue in the West is going to leave uh, Ukraine adrift. And what we're trying to do in this survey, which is a, a poll in 12 European countries, is to test out um, this proposition. And our findings show both why um, the Russians might feel good about this approach and, and be attracted by it, but also, I think, why it might ultimately not work. And there's some uh, very interesting uh, uh, ways, I think, that the, the public opinion is changing in Europe, which I think leaders need to understand if they want to maintain public consensus for the support for Ukraine, which is something that, that we very strongly believe in uh, at ECFR. So um, <clears throat> what we find in this poll is that European voters are living in the shadow both of, of Vladimir Putin, but also of the US elections, mm -hmm. as CV was talking about. And on the sort of three key issues which Ukraine uh, evokes, both Ukraine itself, the whole question of European security and defence, but also the political unity of Europe, we're seeing that both Putin and Trump are forcing Europeans to, to revisit some kind of key assumptions um, which are quite different from, from where we were at the, at the beginning of the war two years ago. So I'll, I'll just look at these three issues one at a time. Um, and I think the first thing which is, is very clear is that this moment is bringing much more strategic clarity about what a Ukrainian victory or a Ukrainian defeat might entail. And on the one hand, our, so we asked this poll about how the war was going to end. And what it shows on the one hand is something very sobering. Only one in 10 Europeans think that the U Ukraine is going to win back all of its territory, um, which is very different from the findings we found, uh, you know, in the, in the kind of height of optimism last summer during the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Twice as many people think that Russia could win the war. But most people, a plurality of people, think that there'll be some sort of uh, compromise um, settlement uh, that, that ends the war. But... Um, what is interesting as well is that though that's how people think the war will end, it doesn't reflect what their, what their preferences are. In most countries, people not just feel very strongly that it's Russia's fault and are uh, 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 appalled at the illegal invasion of, of Ukraine, but uh, in many countries, they want us to, uh, as Europeans to carry on backing Ukraine um, rather than seeing a, a Ukrainian... Uh, uh, defeat. And one of the things which um, we looked at is how people feel about Trump's victory and how it will affect the world. And this slide shows that on some areas, Europeans don't really know what to expect. So a war between China and the US, 25% think it'll be more likely under Trump, 24% will think it's, it's less likely. Um, and you've got equally kind of balanced things on, on a lot of, of, of other issues. But what is very clear is that um, a very large number of Europeans think that Trump's election will make it much less likely for Ukraine to succeed against Russia. So in other words, a Trumpian victory um, in the minds of many Europeans is, this, is equivalent to a defeat of, of, of Ukraine. Um, so we asked people what they would do were Trump to, to come to power and to, um, uh, to withdraw US support and to try and force... Ukraine to, to settle. Um, what you find is a very sort of interesting picture where in some countries uh, like Sweden and Poland, you know, you have a majority, and, and Portugal, interestingly, you have a majority of people who uh, either want to carry on support at the same level or to increase it to try and replace uh, American support. Um, you know, you have other countries like Greece and Hungary, which are at the other extreme. But what you see, if you add it together, but also in, in the majority of countries that, that, that we polled, is that 
a plurality of people either want to carry on support at the current level or to increase it. So you have this kind of sense on the one hand of, of pessimism, but at the same time, uh, a kind of feeling that Europeans are not in the mood for appeasement. They don't want a Minsk III, which they see um, uh, being offered uh, by, uh, um, uh, you know, as part of a Trump peace plan. They see that more as a, as a, as a, as a defeat for, for, for Ukraine. And I think what that's leading to, and it's something Ivan's written brilliantly about, and I'm sure we'll talk more about, is a reassessment of what Ukrainian victory and defeat looks like, which is focused less on the idea of territory and more on the geopolitical orientation which uh, Ukraine can have, the idea of a Ukraine that can be part of the West, that can be part of Europe, that can be part of NATO, rather than simply focusing on, on, on territory. The, the second um, interesting um, uh, finding is, is to do with um, uh, the European debate about, uh, about security and, and defence, and we've seen a kind of huge turnaround in the, the figures for spending on, um, on, on military support, which is, I think, echoed in a lot of the polling that we've done. But, you know, we heard from NATO that, that um, uh, up to 20 uh, of, the, uh, of the 23 EU members of NATO will be uh, on track to spend 2% um, by the time of the, the NATO summit, and collectively the Europeans are up to, to, to 2%. And I think, you know, Putin does deserve quite a lot of credit for that shift, but Trump also should take his, his, uh, his share of, of credit for that, not least with his uh, recent uh, uh, rhetoric. But I think that the kind of final thing which is, is most interesting is um, what this slide shows, which is... Um, the Trump's contribution to the sort of, sort of political unity of Europe. In 2016, when he was first elected, many people feared that he would be the leader of a, of a global liberal international, which would have a lot of echo in uh, different European capitals. And at the time of the last European elections, five years ago, the big fear as Steve Bannon went round Europe working with far-right parties in different countries, was that the European elections would be act three of a play which started with Brexit in the UK, carried on with your 2016 elections, and which was going to transform the European Parliament into a, into a kind of Trumpian um, uh, populist uh, body that would refound the European Union. And what this slide shows is that Though there is likely to be uh, a, a far-right surge in the, the European elections, and we can talk more about that in the discussion, what we're not seeing is uh, a, a pan-European shift uh, towards um, uh, Trumpian politics. In fact, in many countries, the far-right parties have been actively distancing themselves both from Putin and from Trump. And this poll shows that even uh, in Hungary, which is uh, a country which stands out in having publicly embraced uh, Donald Trump, where at least its, its, its prime minister has, uh, only 28% of, uh, of Hungarians uh, would be uh, pleased or very pleased were Trump to, to win the elections. And the, 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 the truth in, in most countries is that a large majority of people will be uh, disappointed um, so in, in those ways, you can see that actually the U.S. election is, is both something that is scaring Europeans, but is actually in some ways driving them to take more responsibility for what's happening in Ukraine. And in a, a slide which I haven't shown here, we can see that the Europeans actually for the first time are starting to realise that Ukraine might be less of a global war, but, uh, and, and that uh, attention in other parts of the world, including the U.S., might be shifting away. But that actually makes them feel even more responsible for it. And, uh, and there is a sense that this is something which, which is existential for, for European security and is something which they can't run away from and therefore have to take responsibility for. Thank you very much. This is indeed uh, extremely revealing and, and fascinating uh, research. Uh, Ivan, were you surprised by those findings? So I'll start with the fact that when I was a student, before 1989, there was a poster uh, in our classroom that religion is uh, opium for the people, and I believe that slides are opium for the policymakers. <laughs> so from this point of view, I'll try kind of a much more to come with a simple story. We have been polling for the last two years, and this is one of the things that ECFR really devoted itself very much on. Not trying, listen, we don't believe that people have a very clear idea 
on many of these things. It's not about this. We ourselves do not have a very clear ideas, uh, but we are interested in the trends. And what I'm going to do now is not just to focus on this last paper, but to tell you over these two years when we have been polling around Ukraine, which are the three or four things that surprised me most. Because in my view, the most interesting about the opinion polling is something that really surprises you. You don't see it. And we have been polling in Europe. We have been also polling outside of Europe. We have been polling a, a global poll in nine big non-Western countries. And here's the first interesting surprise. We have been polling this at the end of the last year. And there was a simple question. Do you believe that the West is in a war with Russia? Majority of the Russians said yes, 53%. Majority of the Chinese said yes, 62%. In every single country that we polled outside of the West, only South Korea, which is part of the West, <laughs> are not going to agree with this. Only in Europe and the United States, we believe that we're not in a war. For different reasons, probably in America, because what you know, what it means to be in a war, because you have been in a war for a long time and you have soldiers here and there. In Europe, probably because we're not sure what is, in a, war, what is a war, because we were not very much exposed recently. But at the end of the day, I find this very important because when we went to these people and also outside of the West, the idea that Russia is winning is the prevailing view. There was a certain type of uh, correlations that made a very strong impression on Mark and, uh, and me. And this was that majority of people who believed that Russia is going to prevail in Ukraine believe that European Union is not going to be around in the next 20 years. And here comes my first question. We talk a lot about what is victory and what is defeat. I believe that people should be slightly more inventive and creative when they talk about victory it's quite important to know exactly what is defeat. And particularly defeat, not simply for Ukraine, but for Europe. Because what you understand of this public opinion perception is that if Russia is going to prevail in Ukraine, basically people outside of the West is going to perceive this as a defeat of the West and particularly of Europe as a whole. This is going to change the way the others are viewing you, the way basically the others are going with you. And I find this very important, and this is why for us, it was critically important to define what is the meaning of defeat. And for me, the meaning of defeat is if basically Ukraine not simply is going to lose territories, and as you see, many people basically believe that this could happen, but basically if the political choice that the Ukrainians did is going to be lost if Ukraine is not going to be integrated in the Western structure. It's basically, it's going to be a kind of a no man's land, which is not going to have neither economic sustainability, not basically political belonging. And this is why this type of understanding for me was quite important when we were talking what we are learning from the polls. The second thing that uh, very made a strong impression uh, on me on the polls was we decided to ask also the question, out of the five major crises, that Europe has been dealing with in the last 15 years. Global financial crisis, you have climate, you have COVID, you have migration, you have the war. Which of these crises basically people in Europe believe is the most important when it comes seeing the future? In a certain way, we try to see which are the crisis stripes in Europe. How people basically see which is the most important one. And of course, first of all, geography matters a lot. You go to Poland, you go to the Baltic Republics, and you're going to see that the war is number one crisis. To the extent that basically in places like Estonia, uh, more than 60% are going to see this as the major crisis. You go to France, only 6% believe that this is the most important crisis. There are other crises that people said. And by the way, these five tribes are so similar to each other as a size. But this is important because in a certain way in politics, uh, this type of uh, tribes has an incredibly important internal dynamics. And when we have been looking around, it's quite important to understand that you cannot win elections just focusing in, on Ukraine if you're not going to be very much in the countries which are neighboring. But Europe is never going to keep its unity if it's not going to realize that for countries like Poland or Baltics, but also Sweden, Finland, it's not about solidarity with Ukraine only. It's about their core security. And this is what for me was very interesting. When you go back and see the divisions about the war, when the war started, the major division was between East and West. And they have a different fears. 
the Western Europe, Germany, France feared nuclear war. Eastern Europe feared occupation. And then with the next studies that we have been doing, you see how the picture starts to change. It was not east-west, it was east-east. Funnily enough, you understand that the countries which were most supporting for Ukraine are the countries not that have been part of the former Soviet empire, but the countries that have been part of the former Russian empire. So you have Poles, Poles, but also Finland. And then you have Bulgarians, Serbs, Greeks. It is, the level of support is much lower, let's put it like a Bulgarian in a more elegant way. Uh, and I do believe this is critically important because as a result of the war, we learn how the long history comes back how the post-imperial maps are coming, and basically you can see the imperial maps behind them. And on this I want to end up, because when we went in these uh, studies and when we're seeing how the Ukrainian war is going there, and this is where Marx started from, funnily enough, what is happening on the elections is going to affect the war. By the way, President Putin is not going to lose the war on the Russian election boxes. <laughs> He's doing fine there. Uh, so from this point of view, his major story is that Europeans cannot sustain political support for a long time. On the other side, for Europe, the biggest problem is, particularly in a moment in which the American support is there, to understand that as a result of the war, some of the major assumptions on European idea of security has been based, has been radically questioned by this war. Listen, we were taking peace for granted. That's it. In a certain way, war was unthinkable. One of the reasons, basically, Europeans were less ready to believe some of the American intelligence information on the eve of the war is that you don't believe that this can happen. Secondly, we betted that hard military power is not as important as it was. And it turned out that it is not, particularly if you don't have it. Uh, thirdly, and this is critically important, American security guarantees are much more questioned than before. You can make any type of a speeches in Washington. People are looking around. For months, the American Congress cannot vote the money in the moment in which Ukrainians really need ammunition. Listen, if you're basically closer to the Russian border, you're not <laughs> radically reassured. And from this point of view, and the last and important story that we understand, and it was also mentioned by Mark, the idea that we can make the war in Ukraine the turning point from which the West can rally many non-Western parties, parties in defense of the liberal order in turn to be a fantasy. In a certain way, many of the people look around, they didn't like particularly what Russians did, but said it's your war, why it should be more important than our war. And secondly, they said, okay, it's risk, but there are also opportunities. And while we're telling ourselves how others are standing and sitting on the fence, Many of these countries are not sitting. So Asli is here. Do you believe that President Erdogan was sitting? I do believe he was running all the time. They're seeing opportunities and Indians and others. So this is why for us, this type of a policy uh, talk and the idea of the public opinion polls go together. Because in a certain way, what we have also learned from the United States in 2016, it's not enough to have a consensus on the level of the foreign policy elites. Be sure that people are part of this elite, of uh, this consensus, because otherwise you can be surprised in the way that you don't want to be. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivan. Um, Sofia, you come from Europe, but you live here and work here. So does this conversation surprise you about the way the war is felt differently yeah, on both sides of the Atlantic? I mean, uh, are, are you surprised by this? Mm. So first let me, thank you, Sylvie. First let me say welcome also from, from me to ECFR <laughs> in, in DC. We need more Europeans. Uh, and we get Jeremy, but you're an honorary European. <laughs> we're, we're really happy to have you. Um, We've adopted him. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> so I think... <laughs> This is a really, really interesting um, two papers, really, that we're discussing here and the, and the polls that are at the, at the heart of them. I have to say you ask very hard questions to people that I think some European leaders would probably struggle to answer. But I uh, really find very interesting, particularly 
uh, the sections in your research where you get to the so what, right? So the meat of what does this mean for the European elections? What does this mean for how we need to make the case for mm -hmm. Europe, how we need to make the case for Ukraine? Uh, and there, I think uh, it's really good that in your research you point out this tension between the dual need to, uh, on the one hand, having to mobilize those pro-European voters uh, that might not care enough to vote in the European elections, and on the other hand, to depress the Eurosceptic vote uh, that uh, you know, is really a, a protest vote at the national level. Uh, and so I was asked to comment in particular you know, on this European election challenge with the view from Washington. And I think we all find ourselves these days in lots of conversations about the super election year that sometimes draws strenuous parallels between the European elections and the American elections that are, after all, quite different mm. <laughs> scenarios. But I do think it strikes me, reading your papers, reading your research, that uh, there are a couple of t uh, parallels mm -hmm. and a couple of lessons, I think, that we can take from each other when it comes to making the case, right? Making the case for Ukraine, making the case for Europe. And I think I want to make three points, really. Uh, one about uh, what not to do, um, how not to counter the right-wing populism that undermines um, what we do in favor of supporting Ukraine in Europe and in the US. One about what to do, so how to make the case for Europe in Europe and in the US. And then one uh, maybe warning about uh, some of the tensions between uh, pro-Europeans in Europe and pro-Europeans in the US. So briefly, uh, I think uh, the argument that you make about how not to counter right-wing populism um, by not aping right-wing policies, right, not making the same uh, case that the right-wing populists make, I completely agree. I think that is right. And I think we see here as well that you cannot out-Trump Trump, right? Uh, in the run-up to the nominations, some have tried. But the reason that it doesn't work is that it's not about policies. It's about what he stands for. Uh, and he stands for anti-elitism. He stands for anti-establishment. And what I think is crucial when we look at the situation is uh, a warning for Europeans that we cannot define the European project as an elitist project and as an establishment mm -hmm. project. Um, we know that the EU benefits all sorts of people, right? The cohesion funds, the common agricultural policies benefit disadvantaged members of society. But, uh, and the paper by Mark and Ivan makes that point, it is hard to focus the debate on the EU's successes in the face of deeply ingrained notions of the EU's weaknesses. And we know that, you know, and we, Mark and I were both in the UK when Brexit happened. It's really hard to lecture people about how they benefit from the EU. Uh, and Biden, uh, President Biden, is experiencing a similar situation, uh, a similar perception trap where, you know, the economy is actually going well here, uh, but people associate former President Trump with economic success and not President Biden. So he faces the same challenge of how to make the case for his own policies without lecturing people. And I think if we look at what uh, President Biden, how he framed that challenge in the State of the Union, there's something we can learn from uh, a European perspective about how he did that. He talked about come back America, right? <laughs> he talked about uh, acknowledging the weaknesses that are still there, but really focusing on the successes of his administration. And so it's really uh, about you know, he talked about ideas. He talked about the international order, freedom and democracy, countering authoritarian forces. We can talk about ideas in Europe, too, when we talk about supporting Ukraine and the need for supporting Ukraine. But what we do when we do that is mobilizing those that are already with us, right? But to sway those who are not yet convinced, I think you do have to tell a story about interests. And so how do you make the case for Europe? How do you make the comeback Europe story work ahead of the European elections and in the context of continued support to Ukraine. Um, and I think in your, in your research you say that it's important to not make it about solidarity for Ukraine and instead make it about sovereignty for Europe. And I wholeheartedly agree. I think uh, we need to make the case for a Europe that is able to act and shape its own destiny. And there are many examples here. One that illustrates this really well is European defense policy. Uh, we need to shift from 
a solidarity-focused short-term aid for Ukraine, consisting of emptying our stocks and warehouses, towards a sovereignty-focused long-term um, European defense production capacity increasement, right? Um, how do you do that? You do that with large-scale orders. What can the EU do? The EU can fund those orders through joint debt, for instance. Mm -hmm. We can have a debate about how to do that. The point is we need a sovereign defense policy, whether there is a Trump presidency or not, by the way. <laughs> Even if there is a, a second Biden term, we cannot allow the future of European security to depend on majorities on Capitol Hill. We talk about Trump-proofing European defense. I mean, we really need to Congress-proof European defense and whether, <laughs> no matter who the next uh, president is. But there is a tension here, and that is my last point. There is a tension here, um, not with the anti-Europeans in the US administration. I think sometimes when I come to Europe, people have a, an idea about the administration being fundamentally anti-EU, anti-European in some mm -hmm. way. I don't think that's the case, actually. I think, I mean, I don't want to overstate the US interest in the European elections. <laughs> it's a... It's an uphill battle in Europe to get people to go to vote. I don't think that here uh, it's a huge, a huge interest. But people do care. People care about the future of von der Leyen, um, who has been a real partner to this administration. They care about the future of the peace facility, and they care about the future of uh, Ukraine and the EU. Um, so I don't think that the problem is with anti-Europeans. I think the tension is how can Europeans make the argument for Europe at home and help make pro-Europeans make the argument for Europe in the US? What do, you mean, what do I mean by that? I mean, pro-Europeans here are combating ideas of a free-riding Europe, outdated transatlantic relationship. Uh, Ukraine has completely been hijacked by domestic politics. Behind closed doors, they will admit, you know, Europe has stepped up. Europe is contributing to uh, Ukraine support, all of that. But it's not good politics to say that. Instead, you know, what is seen as more promising, I think, by pro-Europeans here to make the case for Europe is to say Europe is a good deal. NATO is a good deal for the U.S. Um, the supplemental for Ukraine is a good deal for the U.S. Mm -hmm. The money we spend on Europe will eventually come back to U.S. businesses, U.S. firms, U.S. Uh, workers. Um, we will see this at the NATO summit, which is the next time that Europeans you know, and actually the last time before the elections that Europeans get to make the case for Europe here in the U.S. And I think the summit will be bringing, brimming with CEOs and defense firms. So how do pro-Europeans square that circle? Put simply, you know, Europe is a good deal at home, European sovereignty, we need to invest in our own defense firms, but Europe is also a good deal for uh, the U.S., and I think that is what we need to do, both to maintain uh, support for Ukraine in the U.S., but also maintain support for Ukraine in Europe. And that is some of the challenges that I see this paper and the polling that you, that you have done highlight. Thank you very much, Sofia, for these uh, comments and very interesting constructive uh, ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's one um, question which has uh, arisen uh, recently which is, um, and you, you alluded to it, uh, Mark, uh, ca can Europe fight the war on its own, uh, depending on what's happening here? But, I mean, it's not only uh, because of Trump. It's, it's because of uh, uh, what we have been observing over the past few months uh, in the political uh, difficulties here. So how I would like to ask the three of you, to ask this question to the three of you, how have you seen uh, the opinion evolving or the, the political ground shifting, both in Europe and here, um, as, as this question was coming up? Mark, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So the first European war that I experienced was the war in uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, my first job was working in the British Parliament in 1992, and I remember the horrors of, of Srebrenica, of, of um, <clears throat> war and genocide returning to the European continent, and a kind of enormous feeling of powerlessness, which then led to lots of debates about European defence and European security and rapid reaction forces, and lots of policy papers and other... Um, uh, things which left very little trace in terms of European capabilities. And we've had several decades 
of the Europeans talking about uh, the need to, to be geopolitical, to take defence seriously, to be less uh, dependent on the US, burden sharing, etc. Um, and I think the people are rightly sceptical about the extent to which things have changed. Because after that, we had Kosovo, we had um, uh, this, you know, the, the situation in, uh, in Georgia in 2008, we had the annexation of Crimea, and crises have come and gone, but European defence spending has carried on going down yeah. um, <laughs> over the years, as has the, the sort of strategic culture. It's, it's degraded ever further with each crisis. Um, so, I, you know, there are lots of reasons to be very sceptical about where we are at the moment. But I'm actually quite optimistic about what's happened. I think something really quite important has happened, and Ivan described it a bit before, which is, I, you know, I think it's a massive security crisis. It is something which is terrifying what's happened in Ukraine. But I think even more important than that has been this identity crisis for a lot of European countries. And I think the way that Europeans uh, in many parts of the continent think about themselves but also think about the institutions which they have, has changed fundamentally. And I've, I've written an essay um, uh, called The EU as a, as a War Project. And the basic idea is that for, for, you know, for, for most of the last seven decades, the European Union has, has, uh, and European integration has been driven by the, the quest for peace. And actually, over the last couple of years, a lot of the energy has come from actually preparing for, for war. And you've seen this happen at a national level where lots of countries have fundamentally changed their sense of themselves. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's a cottage industry to complain about Germany and where Germany's going. And the glass is definitely at most half full in terms of the Titan vendor and what's happened over the last couple of years. But it is pretty remarkable if you look at the debates in Germany now to the debates in Germany like three years ago about... You know, very few people are, are, are saying that we need to understand Russia, we can't look at, at history in this way, that we shouldn't invest in defence. It's a very different debate. There are all sorts of debates about Taurus and whether that gets sent or not and what missile systems get. But it's a, it's a very different kind of debate. I think there's been a fundamental um, shift in terms of hard power and military spending. I think in France, you've had a similar change where there's a real interest in, in Eastern Europe and their support for enlargement, which goes completely against the sort of French DNA. In uh, Italy in, and in uh, Poland, you had political elites that were elected on the basis of seeing Europe, Brussels as an enemy of national sovereignty. And now they realise that actually um, Brussels is a, a way of giving them sovereignty. In the UK and other places, there was a kind of sense that, and in a lot of Atlanticist countries, there was a sense that if you were in favour of a strong transatlantic relationship, you'd have to be against European strategic autonomy. And I think people realise, actually, that the only way of saving a transatlantic relationship is for Europeans to get their act together and to stop being so dependent. And that it's impossible to justify the extent to which we have depended on, uh, on the goodwill of American taxpayers for the, for the last few decades. So I think there's been a fundamental change in terms of how people see themselves. And it will take quite a long time to work its way through the system. The, the terrifying thing is the next six months um, and whether, whether we can get enough shells to Ukraine, whether we can stop um, the, the Ukrainian front from, from collapsing. But... I think if you take a longer term perspective, something quite fundamental has changed. And I think it's also, you know, essential because the, the only way that the transatlantic relationship can survive is for Europeans to, to take uh, a different attitude towards their own security. Uh, it, you know, it is very difficult to explain to my 12 year old daughter and my 15 year old son, you know, the, the extent to which mm -hmm. Europeans, rich Europeans are are expecting Americans to, to pay for, for, um, for their security, you know, decades after the end of the Cold War. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're in a kind of different place. Um, and, you know, I think that the, um, <clears throat> we could very well see this as a, a real changing moment, which would be quite different from what happened in the Balkans and what happened in 2008 and what happened with the annexation of Crimea?
As you say, it's probably in Germany that the most brutal and deepest change has had to happen, and it's probably not over. Uh, um, but um, you also describe a race against time now, uh, and we don't know whether we're going to win this race. Um, Ivan, um, some, not all European countries uh, were, mis were, were wrong, actually, or had a mistaken analysis on, on Russia and on the situation. So how would you describe this change also? You were talking about this east-west divide at the beginning of the war. How, do you, how would you qualify this uh, evolution? So the reason I'm on this panel is not to get excessively optimistic. <laughs> so this is time to balance on this. Uh, uh, so, yeah, but some, yeah, some uh, no, listen, this is this is really a moment of identity change, both for Russia, for Ukraine, and for the European Union. This is not simply change of policies. Europe was living in a post-war world till 2022, because 2014 kind of was dismissed. If you see, if you are living on the moon and coming to look at the military budgets of Europe after annexation of Crimea. You're never going to understand that annexation of Crimea happened. Uh, and from this point of view, post-war world suddenly overnight becomes a pre-war world. And it's a totally different world. And for Europe, and this is why, uh, of course, East Europeans were much more ready for this world, particularly those that have been on the border. By the way, Eastern Europe is much more divided. Poland and Hungary are not on the same place, if you're mm -hmm. going to. By the way, a country like Romania is very interesting for very kind of reasons. Public opinion is much closer to Italy than, for example, to Poland. Even in countries like Poland, which did incredible things, there was a moment in the beginning of the war where 8% of the households in Poland have been hosting Ukrainian refugees and taking care of them. But at the same moment now, you basically see that Polish society is becoming very nervous about what is happening with the agricultural products and basically losing economically. Uh, the relations towards the, uh, the refugees uh, from Ukraine is also changing. And by the way, even certain things that work as a good news can be a bad news. For example, Ukrainians are treated as a refugees very differently by the Europeans in the way, for example, people coming from Africa or Middle East. But if you're a Ukrainian government, believe me, the fact that your people are welcomed is not necessarily a good news because many of them will not go back to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest problems that Ukraine really is facing is a demographic crisis. Ukraine is losing people. Uh, and also you have a situation in which for two years a lot of men and women are totally basically separated. We have the number of divorces going up. So what I do believe people from time to time don't realize is first the scale of the war. When we talk about the war in Yugoslavia or when people see war on television, you're going to see one kind of a town being destroyed here or there. Listen, in Ukraine, you have two very big countries in European kind of a scale that are fighting each other. One of them is a nuclear superpower. The front line is 1,000 kilometers and the mines are much more than in North Korea between North and South Korea. The number of artillery shells that on a daily base are fired in Ukraine is on the level of the World War II in 1942. I do believe from time to time we're missing the scale. This is a big European war. And also for Europeans, this is a cultural change. After particularly 1989, uh, this was not part of the social contract. You don't have the feeling that government has the right to ask people to die. We're talking about Germany. But listen, you should understand that in a certain way for Germany, what we're seeing is the crisis of the post-war identity of Germany. Germany did with Russia what they did with everybody. Trading, believing that economic interdependence is going to be enough uh, basically to secure peace. They did what worked for them and suddenly it didn't. And the country, of course, is spending money and of course it is changing, but it is a cultural change. Country that was praised for years, for not having soldiers. Now it's going to be judged on how good its soldiers are. And this time story, and this is where I'll go. I do believe Ukraine is in a very vulnerable position and all of us in the next six months, for many reasons. Also, I do believe that 
France contributed to this in an attempt to create a strategic ambiguity with respect to uh, what we can do in Ukraine and so on, this famous remark that we can end up with French troops in uh, Ukraine. We created a strategic clarity <laughs> with <laughs> basically major European countries said, no, no, we are not going, President Biden going in the State of the Union and saying that they are not going to be American troops. So from this point of view, we're in a situation in which for the next six or seven months, Russia has basically advantage on the ground they managed to create a war economy in which, at the moment, they're producing two mo twice more munitions than we're doing together. Thirdly, basically, Ukraine is really has a manpower problem because they have also their mobilization problem. And it's a major demographic change that they should decide. They don't have enough young men. And I'm saying all this because people believe that in six or seven months, this type of trajectory is going to change. But the problem is to survive these six or seven months. And here, the stories, and this is why for me it's very important, you cannot expect that European publics in two years are going to change dramatically. You can change budgets. But I am not a great specialist on military story, but I have learned one thing from the generals. Budgets do not fight wars. People fight wars. And by the way, Ukraine is a great example of this. So from this point of view, how Europeans are culturally changing is the biggest problem. To what extent our view of the world is changing? How the view of our governments are changing? And from this point of view, and this is my last point, Ukrainian war is a European moment and nationalist moment at the same time. During the Maidan, there were European flags in Kiev. In the war, there was a Ukrainian flag in Europe. <laughs> in a certain way, this was the power of the nationalist mobilization in Ukraine that shows to the people that the famous Brechtian kind of uh, story that, that he feels pity for people, that, uh, for nations that need uh, heroes, does not work in the time of war. In the time of war, you will need people who are ready to sacrifice. But to what extent Europe is ready for this? I don't know. But we are not Europe that some of you know from before. It's not the same. Is it going to work or not? I hope that Mark is right. I'm not going to bet that this is the only outcome possible in the way I don't believe how America is going to look in three or five years, but we are not where we have been. And from this point of view, polling is good at this. Polling is not telling you what to do, but telling, polling is telling you what you cannot do anymore. <laughs> so what we, you, you're both describing is a very European war. And uh, Macron, uh, President Macron the other day asked this question, is this our war or is it not our war? And how, how is it seen from here? Do you also see an evolution or not? So, mm -hmm. I do see an evolution. <laughs> I mean, you asked, can Europe fight this war by itself, right? Could Europe fight a war like this by itself? Sure. <laughs> if you put together all our military budgets, if you look at our economy compared to Russian economy, Sure. If you look at, and I actually agree with you, that there has been a mindset sh shift, certainly when it comes to how Russia is seen in Europe. Absolutely. But uh, budgets don't fight wars, but you can't fight a war without money. And you can't hire the people you need to Fair fight point. a war without money. Uh, and so I think, and I can't help myself with the recommendations, but I think we actually have a very clear path towards getting Europe to be able to fight this kind of war, but we're not there right now. What we need is a defense industrial overhaul to increase our production capacity. And again, I'm going to bring up euro bonds because we need EU-level funding for that. Um, what we need is to, in the short term, again, I agree, get Ukraine through the next six months, but then what? You know, get Ukraine through the next year. It doesn't stop. This isn't, this war doesn't actually follow the electoral cycle of the US. It, it follows its own battlefield logic. And what we have to, of course, consider is that if we have another Trump presidency, we face a very different situation. We face a situation where it's not just about investing in our defense industries and getting equipment to Ukraine, mm -hmm. right? President Trump would not need to withdraw from NATO to fundamentally weaken European security architecture. He can insert his own personnel in Brussels. Uh, he you know, can make Richard Grinnell his ambassador to NATO he, or his state secretary. He can uh, withdraw U.S. troops and he can question the U.S. nuclear umbrella. 
where does that leave Europeans faced with a Russia that would be emboldened if we have a President Trump that forces Ukraine into some sort of deal with Russia? So then what do we do? Again, I have recommendations. So there, are, there is a very clear uh, gaps that Europeans need to invest in, right? Uh, there are capability gaps that have existed for a long time, strategic enablers, ISR. There's the nuclear umbrella gap that we have to have this conversation about how to replace a U.S. nuclear umbrella should it no longer be there. And we have a command and control gap of capable officers in the NATO headquarters and the EU headquarters that could actually replace the very, very capable U.S. officers that currently do this job. So can Europe fight this war right now? No. Could mm -hmm. Europe fight a war like this in the future if we make the right investments? Then yes. Well, so we should are, ask the Russians yeah. to wait for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, that's our problem. <laughs> I've been saying this for a while. <laughs> These are very, very tough questions, and I don't think we're going to answer all of them today. But before I give you the floor, there's one question even that you raised also, which is very important. You said the rest of the world doesn't believe us, basically, or doesn't believe our narrative. Uh, how, how important is this? Listen, for me, it's important, and you remember when the war started, there was this famous uh, uh, statement of the Kenyan ambassador in the UN who yeah. basically said, listen, we in Africa are better understanding what is going on because it's a classical anti-colonial war. Uh, but the problem with this is it's very difficult for some of the former colonists uh, to identify it with the Ukrainian anti-imperialism, which is absolutely legitimate, when they see basically the former colonial power being their major supporters. Secondly, Soviet Union benefited, incred uh, Russia benefited incredibly from the fact that they get the legacy of the Soviet Union, support for some of the anti-colonial uh, uh, movements during the Cold War, at the same time not being the Soviet Union which means that they really didn't threaten much this kind of a countries. And we also ended up with a situation in which, and for me this was eye-opening, if you compare the social uh, media activity in the first three weeks of the war in Ukraine and in the first three weeks in the war in Gaza, in a country like Brazil, you're going to see that four times more social media activity was on the Gaza war. So suddenly Gaza war became a global event mm -hmm. while the war in Ukraine became a European event. And I do believe that Europeans should realize this. This is very much our war to the extent that unlike to the United States, for Europe this is going against the major kind of a security concerns of EU member states. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what happens was that many of these uh, non-Western countries, they are not less hypocritical than we are, let's put it mildly. But in a certain way, they have the feeling that they have the right to be cynical because uh, in a certain way they see themselves as weaker. And I do believe that one of the things that we are trying to understand is that what for us was an order, for many of them was disorder. And now they're trying basically to benefit. They see opportunities. They're repositioning. They're not going with Russia. None of them, even Chinese, are not trying to be perceived as kind of a couple. But they're trying to go very much after their interests and how to deal with this country. And this is particularly true for Europe. is incredible. And secondly, for countries like France, it became clear to what extent basically the failure of France to deal with some of its post-colonial legacies in Africa resulted in what we are seeing basically there. So we're in a different world, not simply Europe and not simply Eastern Europe. And the fact that the Cold War narrative has been replaced by the decolonization narrative is also one thing that we should keep in mind. When the war started, President Biden said this is a fight between democracies and autocracies. But do you know where is the problem with this? Authoritarianism today is just the opposite to pornography. You remember the famous definition of pornography. We don't know how to define it, but when you're going to uh, basically see it, we're going to recognize it. The problem with authoritarianism is very easy to define it, but in many places when we're going to be see it, we're not ready to recognize it. Depending on the day, some countries are democracies, some countries are basically autocracies. Uh, when you see how we are composing all this type of a camps, you can see that the nature of the political regime is not what decided basically how India, for example, or South Korea or Brazil are going to position themselves. And in my view, we should be ready basically to face this reality and to say we're in a different world. We should try to engage with others also on the agendas that are very important for them. We try to show 
that we can solve our problems. And in a certain way, this is, of course, very different than it was. But, and this is my last point on this, if everybody has his fears, my fear always was defending the status quo that does not exist anymore. Because in my view, this is such a self-defeating mm. position. Mm. And unfortunately, if you are winners of the previous round, you are kind of tempted to do exactly this. I do believe that Europe have been doing this with respect to Russia after 2014. So probably deciding to understand and to realize the fact that the world is not in the way it was. And probably it's never going to go back in the way it was. Okay, so I will collect uh, some questions if there are yet. There's one here. Uh, do we need a mic or? Okay, uh, here in the front, please. Hi, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Great uh, conversation. Um, I was wondering if there's any specific priming factors or narratives or contextual cues that you've seen in your research that um, kind of get people to be more supportive of Ukrainians and their war effort, um, and then also how that can be transferred in this transatlantic context in the United States. Would you like to take this, Mark? Um, I think what it's maybe worth starting with the things which 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 aren't kind of working very well. And I think that that slide which we sh showed you, where only ten percent of people think that Ukraine can win, is a is a good starting point. So if you basically go to the public with something which feels implausible, then you're likely to, to just meet a wall of skepticism. So therefore, part of what you need to do, I think, is to have a, a kind of story about, which is kind of credible for the, for the public. If most people think that this is ultimately going to end in some kind of settlement, that, you know, I think it's more plausible to say we want to put Ukraine in as strong a position as possible, so it doesn't just have to accept uh, <clears throat> an end to the war on Russian terms and to be forced. To, and that's a much more plausible way of making the case than, than saying that, you know, every inch of Ukrainian territory, even though that's what people want and is obviously the right thing to do, and I don't think any European country is going to recognise an inch of, of, of Russian territorial acquisition. Mm -hmm. But I think a good starting point is just to understand what people think is going to happen and to, to talk to people in those sorts of terms. I think the other important point, something that Ivan said and, and Sophia was saying earlier as well, which is to, to, to make the case in terms of people's national interest and their own security. If people, you know, it's very different for Estonians and for Poles because, it, you know, they do feel um, <laughs> that they could be next in a way that Italians or or Spanish people, or even British people and, and French people don't feel. so. But at the same time, if we make a case which is more centred around uh, European security, around our ability to control our own future, that's going to be more credible than an altruistic um, set of actions for, for Ukrainians. There was a lot of altruism at the beginning of the war, but that's not something which you can sustain indefinitely over long periods of time. I think one of the really striking things about the polling is, is how Ukraine has big, got big problems with its, with its neighbours. It's that many of the countries that showed the most solidarity with Ukraine at the beginning are now the ones with the most mixed feelings. And you can mm -hmm. see that if you look at the Polish farmers um, and uh, uh, their attitudes towards migration. We asked people whether they thought migrants from Ukraine were a, an opportunity or a threat. And <clears throat> actually, if you look at the aggregate figures... Uh, for Europeans, they're quite positive, much more positive than I was expecting. If you look at the the talk about a new migration crisis and twenty, but the the countries where that wasn't true are Ukraine's immediate neighbours: Poland, Romania, Hungary, where forty percent of people see Ukrainian migrants as a as a threat mm -hmm. rather than as an opportunity. Rather than as an opportunity. Um, so I think that a really important thing is to have is to be quite contextual and to to, to find out a way of, of of making the case. And I think for for the U.S., um, the big problem is you know some of it is about people's perceptions. If there is a perception that Europeans 
are not doing as much as the US. That obviously makes it much harder to make the case for, for, for American support. So I think, you know, part of what Europeans need to do is to, is to get their act together, to visibly take more responsibility for what's happening, to do it for their own sake, not because of Trump or because of anyone uh, else here. And, and if uh, Americans realize that, the, that, um, that they're not carrying an impossible burden for, for, for other players, I think it would be a lot easier to, to, mm. to, to, to make the case for that. I mean, it is kind of interesting, as a foreigner coming here, um, you know, if you look at how much money, blood, how much blood and treasure is being expended on Ukraine and you compare it to Afghanistan and Iraq, it's kind of, you know, there's no comparison. <laughs> and yet the levels of weariness now are much higher than they were in these wars, which were much more costly for the US. Um, and, you know, I think it's because partly because it's a compound experience. So this comes after the forever wars and the the, the sense of frustration about where American foreign policy was going and the loss of a domestic consensus for, for American grand strategy. But it, it is, um, it's interesting how you can shift out of, you know, once you get into that narrative structure, how you get out of it and you reset it. Is, I think it's very, very complicated and difficult to, mm -hmm. to do. Sophia, you wanted to come in, and then I'll go back to Mark because of something you mentioned. And go, go ahead, sure? Sophia. I mean, yeah. just... Just briefly, I think that altruism is one of the main traps uh, when we're talking about this war and how to rally support for Ukraine. This isn't about helping Ukraine. It's about saving Europe. It's about saving ourselves, right? Uh, and that is really important also because the war is not going to be over or the threat is not going to be over with the deal. There is a huge challenge of integrating Ukraine in Europe's security yeah. architecture mm -hmm. that is going to remain at least as long as Putin is president, mm -hmm. if not longer than that. And so we have to continue keeping up support for that. And this is where we get into trouble in Europe over... The mic always drops out after a while. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> um, distributional challenges, right? And this is why when we talk about Ukraine, we now have to talk about common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. We have to find a deal that works for the Poles in con to continue supporting Ukraine um, and the French. And the French, of course, <laughs> uh, uh, and farmers all over Europe, yeah. really, uh, uh, in, when, it, when it comes about continuous support for Ukraine, integrating Ukraine into the EU and Europe's security architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, and one final thing that I just wanted to say is that uh, actually I believe this is also... You know, you said we have to make Ukraine strong enough so that they can uh, have negotiations with, uh, with Russia at some point from a st position of strength. And that, incidentally, I think is also the argument to President Trump. <laughs> if he wants to make a deal, <laughs> it makes sense to make Ukraine, to put Ukraine in a very strong position now, put through the supplemental uh, give them the money now so that then when he comes in, he can swoop in <laughs> and from a position of strength negotiate a deal. Well, if the supplement could be passed now, that would be great <laughs> as a start. Uh, um, Mark, you, you mentioned the UK. And of course, it's not included in, <laughs> in your research for obvious reasons. Uh, but when you talk about uh, countries which reacted differently because they were closer or, or farther away from Ukraine. Actually, the United K Kingdom is a bit of an exception, no? because it's far away, but yet it, was, it had a very voluntary policy on Ukraine for a long time. Yeah, look, I mean, I, you know, being cards on the table, I was not a supporter of Brexit. I think it was an act of extraordinary self-harm. Um, but... Uh, and I think that the, the sort of psychodrama that Britain's been going through with its European policy for the last few years has not been an edifying spectacle for anyone. But I do think that one of the things that has started to change uh, attitudes both in London and in other European capitals um, beyond, you know, simply time passing and, and obviously the, the lack of, of of, of major benefits from these new Brexit freedoms which accrued to, to British citizens was the war in Ukraine, which has reminded people that, you know, Britain might have left the, the European Union, but it can't leave the European continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And its security and its interests are ultimately completely entwined with its neighbours. And the idea of a geopolitical Europe without Britain is possible to imagine, but it's a lot harder 
Um, and it's also unnecessary. And I think that is leading to, you know, even um, when Boris Johnson was still prime minister, you saw uh, a, a rediscovery of geography um, in the, amongst the British elite and uh, a, a new kind of ethic of collaboration and of, of working together. And, and, you know, Britain's had a lot of prime ministers since then. Um, but the direction <laughs> of travel... We, we've lost with, count. Yeah. With, <laughs> with each one has been to, 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 to look at, at ways of working more closely uh, with the EU. And we're going to have another prime minister uh, probably before the end of the year. And I, I suspect that we're going to see a, a kind of much bigger step up in the direction of, of, um, uh, of cooperation. And it's going to be, you know, it's going to start with security and uh, you know, the Labour Party in the UK, who have now looked very likely to win the next election, have, have said that one of their top priorities is going to be to sign a security pact with the with the European Union. And, um, and so I that's think another that, change. Sorry? So that's another change. I, I, that's what I'm saying the about list of all of these, ide- all these countries, they have changed their identities. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that... <clears throat> goes through quite a big shift um, and I think there's an appetite for that you know because there hasn't always been a huge appetite for for re-engaging with the UK there's a lot of frustration in Brussels in other capitals but I, I think that Ukraine makes people um, uh, you know take these things a bit more seriously and realize that that there's a lot to be gained from both sides to go back to a different situation so I suspect the UK relationship with uh, with the EU will not you know, Britain's not going to be a member of the EU in five or ten years' time. No. I suspect it will look quite different to the way that it looks at the moment. And there'll be, particularly on security issues, I think there'll mm-hmm. be a much higher level of cooperation and of integration. Yeah, and we can observe some uh, quite a lot of rapprochement on this, in this uh, domain at the moment, yeah. Uh, is there any other question? Yes, please, go ahead here. And... Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, we saw a lot of polling, but um, I think one important question was is missing. Uh, and perhaps maybe you can <coughs> do it in the near future polls. This question was um, about NATO. And um, <coughs> one uh, uh, question is that uh, what do you think the cause of this war? Did Putin invade Ukraine to restore like Soviet empire? And then <clears throat> continue west, and some people in the United States in Congress saying that he will come here as well, or it was simply uh, <coughs> to um, protect his country from NATO, NATO encirclement. And we know that when NATO started expand, many people in this country, United States, objected, and many not not only George Cannon, who just most famous. I recall Senator Moynihan, who in, <laughs> said that he was Senator from New York, that opening NATO expansion would lead to nuclear war. And we know that until uh, February 2014, majority of Ukrainians <coughs> were against NATO expansion, and, and of course the Ukrainian government. But of course, after the coup, uh, this changed. But um, my question is, Mm-hmm. Maybe since you didn't make this polling with your people, maybe panel <laughs> question is, would all this horror be prevented if Ukraine simply will keep neutral status and benefit from both West and East, which probably probably is the best solution for Ukraine? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure Ivan wants to answer this question, and then we'll go over yeah. there. Yeah. Listen, it's a great question because you don't need to have one reason to start the war. <laughs> Uh, and for sure, the Russians were unhappy about the uh, expansion of NATO. Uh, but there is something uh, quite important, and this is what makes the Ukrainian situation very specific. President Putin is quite openly saying what he's doing. We all the time saying he's bluffing and so on. What I have learned over the years is take him literally. And he wrote a piece uh, in the summer of 2022. By the way, it was an essay, which is not the form that the presidents normally do. And uh, I was talking to the Russian colleagues. He wrote it personally. So it was not a speechwriter writing for him. And he made a statement which was not focused on NATO. 
No, yeah. No, no, listen, 2014 is important, and agree. By the way, 2008 and Bucharest summit, which was not the most wise decision ever taken. But my story is that there is a fundamental understanding which President Putin had, and this is that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people. Listen, this is deep. We can decide, could it be differently dealt with? But one of the reasons, uh, basically in 2014, Russia decided not to recognize the territories that they have been controlling was that it was never about certain territories and it was never about certain minorities. It was about his, also in my view, very important demographic fear that the Russian population is shrinking, that the Russian role in the world is shrinking. So in the last three months before 2022, on several occasions without being asked, he made a statement and he said, the famous Russian natural scientist Dmitry Mendeleev, at the end of the 19th century said that in year 2000, there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world. And now they're only 120 and 30. So as a result of it for him, the problem of Belarus and the problem of Ukraine is not simply a security problem, a territorial problem, it's an identity issue. And he's very clear on this. So from this point of view, why I do believe that we can have a very legitimate criticism of uh, the NATO enlargement and how it could have played this way or the other way, to believe that President Putin basically came with the idea that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people in the summer of 2022, is slightly in my view, overdone. He believed this. He always believed that this, not the disintegration of the Soviet Union, but disintegration of this space was totally unnatural. He's a kind of a person of a specific generation and certain type of a showing, and he did what he did. Uh, and I do believe that, of course, certain type of Western policies could be different. But it's now quite clear of many conversations that we had is that basically President Biden make it quite clear two things to him when they meet in Geneva. First, that America is not about the regime change, and secondly, that NATO uh, membership of Ukraine is not a priority for anybody. So from this point of view, I do believe his timing was based on other things. Otherwise, is there certain things that probably the West could have done totally differently after the end of the Cold War? Here, I also have my questions how and what it was done. But don't forget also the Ukrainian perspective. This was society and nation that was promised in 1994 by the United States, United Kingdom, Russia, that if they're going to give their nuclear weapons and they have been the third biggest nuclear power in the world, their security is guaranteed. So it's very difficult to keep them to believe that this type of a level of neutrality is going to work because they were betrayed once. And in my view, this is a big issue. And then we have another question over there. Yeah, no, it was the famous Budapest Memorandum. Yeah. Yeah, over there, on the left. Hi. Thank you for the super interesting conversation. Uh, Leonard Schütte, Munich Security Conference. I wonder whether you can dwell a little more on your conceptualization of victory, because I was quite struck on how you suggested, or at least put out there, to think about moving from territoriality towards political belonging because you know if you listen to debates surrounding NATO membership of course many say territorial integrity is the prerequisite for political belonging thank you I'll be very quick because I'm sure that also the other colleagues <laughs> great I know one country <laughs> that became member of NATO before having all its territory uh, being unified and this country is where the Munich Security Conference is based and this is where <laughs> Germany is so that's <laughs> Mark, you want to take this? I don't think anybody, as I said before, is talking about recognizing the annexation yeah, of any part of Ukraine. That the question is whether a, a Ukraine that is forced into neutrality, that is forced to disarm, um, if that happened to Ukraine, would that be a good or a bad outcome for, for Europeans? Um, and I think that it's pretty clear that if you think about European security and the sort of reasons that we that we that, that, that Europeans are uh, supporting Ukraine beyond a belief in in the inviolability of borders, etc., um, the the idea of, of a Ukraine that is basically um, forced into being a kind of buffer zone and uh, which could protect you know would be a real um, defeat. So therefore. Um, but also, if you think about how this war can end, I think one of the only ways of giving Ukraine 
uh, a real sense of security in the future is going to be having credible guarantees for its for its security and that's why the west german model i think is is, is something which people are talking about and thinking about it's not something that's relevant for for tomorrow but yeah. it's definitely going to be part of, of of discussions when we get to a situation where, where we where we are kind of moving towards a settlement i think it's very hard to for you for any ukrainian leader to talk about um uh, moving to a different phase if they're if they're not getting into the european union or getting into nato if you look at what ukrainian citizens are saying i mean i think that anything which doesn't include those kind of aspects of political belonging will look much more like a defeat than a victory. But it is true that this notion of, I mean, this definition of victory or defeat has been evolving a lot about the past two years. And, um, and that now we are also moving to another debate, which is it's not only about whether Ukraine wins or is defeated. It's also about our, the security of the rest of Europe. And uh, do you, would you agree with this? I think that the mental model for European security in a lot of capitals before was a cooperative model where we made security with Russia and where we were hoping to have a single set of institutions which underpin the security of our continent. And I think as long as Putin is in the Kremlin, that's not going to be the mental model. It's now something which is being done against Russia, and the borders between us and Russia become very, very important. And the clear preference of the Ukrainian people is not to be on the Russian side of the borders. And that's why I think this is big, uh, the, the twin questions of the enlargement of NATO and the European Union take on a completely different significance in that sort of world than the world that we were in a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Oh, so I think we will leave it here and thank our panel for describing this very shifting uh, ground and environment. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.